Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Saint Mary, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. All right, so. We go on in this third section in the Patriarch's letter, and I can tell from the letter, we put the letters out for the people in the parish, that first of all, the idea of the fasting and the penance that he puts in this letter was not something that really anybody wanted to hear about. And so they were studious when you'd ask them, have you read the Patriarch's letter? Yeah, I took one, but it wasn't telling you that I know I didn't read it. So before we go on with this question, let's talk about why we fast. All right. So we start out with what we're doing. Okay. So with the question of the fasting, remembering also that the word fast means strength. This is the reason why we fast. And as I've always mentioned, the Eastern churches have always been famous. The Romans also fasted, obviously, but began to mitigate their fasting quite early on relative to the Eastern churches. The Eastern churches really only kind of collapsed in their fasting and their discipline in the last half century. So, so fast, the word means strength, as the word Doctrine is the teaching and discipline is the learning. That's the meaning of these words when we use them all over the place like this. Now, I'm going to try to use some of the different colors. I mean, some of you say you can't see them, but I'm going to try to do something, because black is just boring all the way across. Now, in the East, according to St. Paul in his epistles, and in the Eastern usual, the, the, the anthropology of the East is tripartite, breaking it into three. Body, soul, and spirit. The Western Church, especially since the Middle Ages of St. Thomas, tend to break it only into two, body and soul. But St. Paul talks about the body, the soul, and the spirit. Now, Father, I, I have to ask you because, as you know, I came from some Protestant teaching, and, and the YMCA was always body, mind, and spirit. Is mind sort of like the soul well, or not? Yeah, we can actually, the mind instead of writing soul, let's do Is it the same? Um, kind of, sort of. The soul just, the soul means the, the source of animation, it, that it's living. Yeah, see, I always d designated a little difference between soul and mind, because mind, you can think about things that soul, are sinful. Soul, <laughs> in its, soul in itself just means life. It just means that it's the source of life. Okay. Petunias have a soul. Right? There's a principle of activity, a principle in inner... So life is just defined as the inner, the, the interior principle of, of life. Okay. Right? That, something, that something takes in nourishment, something grows, it has, a, it has a maturing process, and then the third aspect of life is it reproduces in some way. Right. Okay. And so those are your three animating characteristics, if you like, or the three characteristics that show us animation, which will be nourishment, growth, and reproduction. And reproduction for all of, the, all of the creatures of the earth, except for men, is considered the highest function. 
because they create another, they make another like themselves. It's not the highest function of human beings because we also have spirit. So, if you want what we normally call soul, we can link these together here. These are the part of that aspect which animates the body. Okay. And we keep using the word animate. The word in Latin, anima, just means, it's what we call soul. And so something which is animated is in soul. It's alive. That's the idea. Okay? Which is why the fascination at the beginning of the 20th century, when you had cartoons in that, so you had, or, or the Japanese anime, that you're using these words as something that's moving. But that's, strictly speaking, it's something. Now the distinction winds up being for the question of animation, we talked about petunias have souls. They're material principles. They function organically and they have life. They grow, they grow from seeds, they bring in nourishment, they make sugars, they do all the things that we do that we do study in botan botanics. So in studying in botany, we have taking in nourishment from the outside, we have growth, maturation, and then in maturation, everything, not every single individual being, but all beings reproduce and they make others like themselves. And that is their replication of God in its most perfect form. They make another like themselves. It may be sexual reproduction, or it may be, as we know, on some of the single cellular level, uh, asexual, where you just kind of tear apart and replicate yourself, which always seemed a little grotesque if you thought about it on a larger scale. So, soul and body, that will be our western breakdown, but really in the scriptures and in the eastern breakdown we have <clears throat> body, mind, and spirit. Now, the mind aspect is what is going to give us our reasoning, Our ability to think through things, our reflection of stuff, that we think and ponder and express ourselves in what's supposed to be logical form. That is the human functioning of reasoning. Right? But we also have at this level the question of will, arbitrio. If I use the English term free will, it's too loaded. So we'll just use the Latin term arbitrium. That's where our word arbitrary comes from. So the arbitrium is the, 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 the free choice, free election. The ability to choose something, um, not because you're just starving and you're on your last leg because you haven't eaten in four days and so you just grab animalistically whatever you need to grab. All right. I'm reading a book called um, Paradise Lost. Mm -hmm. And it's on, it's on the burning of Smyrna in 1922, the destruction of what had been the Pearl of the Orient um, in the whole war between the Greeks and the Turks. It's, it's, a, it's a hideous book. It's a hideous book. You just have a conflagration of what had been. The first part of the book shows you in the Edwardian age what this extraordinary place was that was two-thirds Christian in the Turkish Empire. A lot of Greeks, a lot of Armenians. And remember, the Armenians are wind up being, you know, exterminated in 1915. So this all builds up to 1922, in which you have estimates of 300 to half a million people forced onto the edge of the the sea because the entire city is burning behind them, and the Turks, many of them drunk, are picking them off. And so it's it's just absolutely hideous. And the Americans who wouldn't be involved because they're perfectly neutral until finally the scoundrel of the Admiral starts functioning after people. The, the whole Smyrna Bay, of, the whole bay, and the harbor was just filled with corpses. So, anyways, it's an extraordinary book. I just, the reason why I mention it is because these people who have now for three, four, five days not drinking anything, and the fire is so intense, it's like a firestorm, like, like, like um, Hamburg in World War II. They're just a conflagration. The flames are a hundred feet in the air, and the heat they can feel on the ships out in the water. So to even imagine what the people who are huddling on the side, and it's like one huge living sewer, because these people have been here for days, all wedged against the edge of the water, 
And some of them have just jumped in and committed suicide. Some of them, some of them are hanging onto the edge of the key, and you have Turks cutting off their arms, falling in. So you have this hideous thing, and of course a lot of them start acting in an animalistic manner. The reason why I give it is we're not talking about doing things because you are in an extreme and you must drink and you must eat, and so you become quite animalistic. So all of these descriptions, so that the contrast, uh, it, it's a, it's a, it was published in 2008 by a, name, a man called Giles Milton. Well worth reading. You want to really know, you know World War I went, went on for a long time. We say it finished in 1918, but 1922 is really the ending of World War I. So, when we talk about our Beatrium, it is a free selection of choice. Right? And that's why, for a human being making choices, we can do things which, according just to our bodies, don't necessarily make sense. And that's going to be linking us together the question of fasting. Because it's going to be how, what, and when, these questions. You know, your dog, you will never teach to fast on a Friday. If there's food in front of him, he's going to eat. Okay? That's why we talk about animals make choices, but they do not have arbitrium. They make choices. I mean, you can see them make choices. But the problem is, is that what we wind up doing is because we see certain things, we anthropomorphize them and we make them into little people, which they aren't. Which is why when I used to work with the French Dominican teaching sisters, they were always quite scornful of all of these cartoon books and everything in which all animals are, you know, you just have all of these people animals stories. Aesop's Fables was fine because of the fact that it's very clear you're talking about people, but all of these animated cartoons and everything and animals are people. We started with Bambi, that was the first one, right? We anthropomorphize the animals. And so anyway, so animals have choices. They do make choices, and depending upon the, the complexity of the animal, right, the difference between a worm, obviously, and a horse, their, their, their election, choosing, will have a greater refinement. But human beings make choices which are beyond that. That's so why we speak of it as being free will. Yes? I have seen animals, though, be very... Um, uh, sacrifice their own comfort for others, including human companions? Well, <coughs> the question, so the arbitrio, where our word arbitrary comes from. So in the mind aspect is going to be here, and this is where normally in the Western discussions of philosophy everything kind of finishes to some degree here at this level. All right? But the idea of the spirit is the Greek word nous. And the news is that if you want the edge of human life in its pure immateriality, it's what allows us, con as human beings, contact with the divine. Right? I'm not talking about grace, but just as human being in our constitution, it's what opens us up to God, right? what we call the spirit. Remember, the word spirit just means breathe. Right? Spirare in Latin just means to breathe. Spiratus is just something that is breathed. And that's about the best you could do as language develops because you noticed what in grandma? Is at one point, there's no air coming out of her. You know, the famous hold the mirror up to the person to see if they're really dead. Because nothing, no breath is coming out of them. But the word, it's like our word ruho. Ruho, the spirit just actually is wind. Latin also is the same thing, ventus. So you have this idea of things that we know by perception, but we're trying to describe. So spiritus is one of these words, something that's present that we don't see. Our Lord uses that in the Gospel when he says that the Spirit, the Spirit listeth where it will. The Spirit goes where it chooses. And it's like the wind. You don't know where it comes from. You don't see its origin. And you don't know where it's going, but you can perceive it, you feel it, everyone's felt wind. Alright, so, in this breakdown, and so you can go further on through here. So, in the body level, this is where our imagination is. And the imagination is what links us. It, it's, it's the funnel, if you want. It functions as a funnel from all of our sense perceptions into what's going on here. And then, of course, in the body is also going to be 
our sense perceptions. So the five external senses. And in the imagination, this level here is what we also wind up calling, and that's the funnel aspect of all the sense information that's brought in. So the five external senses, that when they're brought in, you know, it's why when we're children and you first discover when you watch the man working on the house, three houses down, and you watch him hammering and then you hear the pound after, because light is faster than, than sound waves. And so, because our mind is telling us that sound that's coming after you're watching him is the same action. And so you're, we're mystified by that. Like when we put the pencil into the, the, jug, the glass of water and it looks like it's broken or bent. And so it's the same thing because our perception of, of, of sense of the, of the pencil and what we see, we know it's not broken. And so one of our first actions is to put your hand down inside the jar of water and feel it. No, it's not broken. So when you watch, when you, you know, children, little kids in school do all these things. Because you're confronted by your senses. What your mind is telling you. Because what's happening is, out of the five external senses, through the imagination, we have what is called the sensus communis. I don't think I've ever done this breakdown, have I? No. 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 So the sensus communis is, is, is that interior, it's an interior sense which, in a sense, rallies the five perceptions that are going on outside of us. Which is why we have this absolute, or when you watch fireworks and you see the colors and then you hear the all over the place and little kids. What, little kids. Everyone loves this because you know that what I'm seeing, it's, you don't hear anything, and then you hear the sounds coming. And your census community, and again, I'm not translating it because census community obviously literally means common sense. The common sense in English, again, is too loaded. And the reason why it's called the census community is because it is rallying, it's bringing the five together. The five senses together are giving you. There's a coordination, if you want, from the five senses. And that's why we call it the interior sense. It's an interior reality linked with imagination, which, which brings together these other senses. But from them, we have what is called, um, I didn't really plan on talking about all of this tonight, so. It's been a few years since I did the whole chart on the board. Um, cognitive sense. Okay. You're going to relate this back to why we fast. Absolutely. Right? Okay. I just <laughs> asked Larry that. All right. So the when, when do the five senses bring together, and the, and the senses communis brings them together, so that what we know when we we're petting this thing that we've seen moving across the floor. Right? Or grab it and squeeze it when you're two and you grab the little kitty and you pop its eyes out because you're trying to figure out why is it moving. Because I have other soft, fluffy things in my room. They never move. Okay. And they just sit there. But this fuzzy thing is moving and so you grab it, you knead it, you pull it. And that's why you do this because you're trying to figure out why is it moving. And so what your mind is doing is bringing all of these senses together and you're trying to perceive why does this fuzzy thing move and the other one in my crib doesn't move. But when they're all brought together, what happens at this level? Now I put down cognitive sense. Cognoscere in Latin is to know, but to know by experience, cognoscere. Cognition? Cognition, literally in Latin, cognoscere, is a knowledge, but it's a knowledge that we have by experience. As opposed to shire, science, which is an intellectual knowledge of abstraction. So, what happens here, and this is why we can anthropomorphize animals. Because what happens here is there is what we call the estimative sense. Estimare 
Estimare, our word is esteem, is a judgment about something. It's in the, in the loose sense, all right? So the estimative sense, everyone, all animals with senses have this. Following so far? So once you have this, the interior imagination, the sensus communis, they're all bringing together your five sense experiences, you have perceptions of that experience which gives you a judgment, estimative. The lamb that's at the feeding trough or is at the pond on the farm and sees a shadow come up doesn't have to turn around and judge whether it's a wolf or something, but will perceive there as danger and will run because of its estimative sense. This is the level where we see animals making choices. All right? Now, because human beings have this level of reasoning and free will and spirit, it is already a participatory aspect in the act of human knowledge. That's why we don't call it estimative for human beings, we call it cognitive. It is the level where it is your inexpressed, non conscious knowledge, or we can say an awareness. Awareness or knowledge it participates in the higher level of human knowledge of intellect and will but it's not intellect and will, it's not your intellectual perception it is the beginning of that perception, and so the other term that St. Thomas will use is it's called, this knowledge is called poetic knowledge. We used to do this with our teachers. All right, and so the knowledge, the term that is used is poetic knowledge. Now, again, these are all loaded, poetic knowledge. Because when I say poet, or poetry, we think of, you know, lyrics. But the word poem in Greek actually means to make something. You know, a poet is a creator of something. They make things. They don't necessarily only be excluded of writing verse. Okay? Now, why are we talking about this? We're talking about this because actually at the human level of education, this poetic knowledge is absolutely essential. If you notice this, five senses, your imagination, and then your free will and your intellectual ability. Because at this level of, of the intellect, the mind, we talk about reasoning here, but the mind and the spirit will link at this point of what we call perception. Intellectual perception, not sense perception, but of knowing something in it, to know the tree as a tree. That's the squeezing of the cat. What the animal, what the child is doing is more than just simply trying to figure out in the lower knowledge of why this is moving, but ultimately trying to figure out what the thing is in itself intellectually. Now, because this is actually all part of this lower sense, the poetic knowledge. Poetic knowledge is something that in education, it's the reason why we have fairy tales and fables and things that we tell children when they're three because they learn. Remember Aesop's fables? Every, every single one of them finishes with a moral teaching. When you read Little Red Riding Hood and in the end she gets eaten up, but that's the original story. Every child understands because she pushes her luck. And no child has ever started crying because she's been eaten, because they have known by the perception of what's going on, of what she's doing. Oh, Grandma, what big teeth you have. Oh, Grandma, what? Oh, Grandma. They, they know, right? They know this is the world. This is the story, right? But the story is teaching them that you don't push your luck like that, and things that you perceive, you don't walk into the middle of danger. I mean, now we rewrite these fables so Little Red Riding Hood never dies. You rewrite um, Don Juan, Mozart's opera. You put an extra scene on so he actually does not go to hell. Someone told me once they watched a, a, a performance that was done 
um, there in, in Boston, I don't know, 25 years ago or something. And there was an epilogue that was added to the opera. And Don Juan, after seducing all these women, is not dragged to hell, but is dragged in death to learn a new lesson, which he learns, and then he returns to life, you know, a renewed man. It's like, that's not the story. Don Juan goes to hell, he's dragged to hell by the demons because what he does is wicked. So these kinds of morality stories, the fables, the children, it's why they've always been around. But you know, like Grimm's fairy tales, you know, a lot of these are medieval. A lot of the medieval fairy tales are very violent. Yes? I refuse to read Hansel and Gretel. Wouldn't do it. Yeah, it's an example. So what happens with, I mean, not all of Grimm's fairy tales were meant for children, but they were all morality, they all have some kind of morality in them that are told by the people. Because this is the level of poetic knowledge. It's creating within you perceptions on how you act. And so we tell these stories and we develop. And for a child who's not yet reached the age of reason, which is why we always use this term, it's the only way that they actually learn things. So what you're doing really for the first seven, eight years of a child's life, six, seven, eight years, is you're forming their poetic knowledge. But you'll notice the poetic knowledge can only be formed through their imagination. So if you destroy a child's imagination, you destroy the very funnel that links all of the sense perceptions of the world around them and that feeds this spiritual and intellectual level which makes us properly human, you cripple that ability of human knowledge because you've crippled the very funnel which is the imagination. And this is really the detriment, philosophically speaking, why when we have children parked in front of screens all the time, whether it's watching television or playing on commuters, where are the images? They're in front of your eyes. What's being exercised? Your one single sense of vision, not your imagination. This is not the days where the kids would take three blocks and a piece of rope and play for the entire afternoon in the backyard. Because their imagination is creating these things. And the imagination must be as exercised as any other sense. And so if you put it at a physical level, if you took a child from the age of two and only carried them, and then at 18, finally put them onto their legs and decided you wanted them to run a marathon in Boston. What are you going to get? Nothing. The legs have never been exercised. They've never been developed. They've never been strengthened. So if you take a child and put them in front of screens from the time, I mean, pediatricians are saying this now, nothing in the first two years, absolutely minimum. You know, but how many little kids are up there popping away? And of course they like it. Who doesn't like sparkly things? We all love those things, which is why we're all addicted to these stupid little computers. Because we are like children from that point of view, and we can never turn them off and put them away. Because we're like the children. So of course our two-year-old acts the same way and screams and throws a tantrum, because they want to play with the screen. Because it sparkles and it dances and it's attractive. But because you're doing that, all of your sounds and everything else are primarily in this box, or in my paws. And you're not exercising the interior faculty of imagination. So if you were the demonic force, the demon cannot touch the spirit, cannot touch the intellect, cannot touch free will. The only entity in existence that can touch mind and will is God. The devil, though, because this is the lower part, the devil can play with your imagination. Now, he pull up all kinds of things to seduce you, right? Do all kinds of things. Shove you into depression. Do all kinds of things to push you by just playing on the images within your existence, within your body, your imagination. Now, if you're the demon, you can't touch the actual spiritual, immaterial faculties of a human being. You can't make someone think something. You can play with the images and push them towards thinking those things, but that's all the demonic can do. So other than touching them directly, which is impossible even to the watchers, then your next, and you can't, you can't cripple everyone in all five of their senses. You can't make everyone physically have no sense of touch, 
no vision, no hearing, no, you can't break all of the senses externally. So the place where all of the external senses come together interiorly and make the connection with the spiritual aspect of the human being is the imagination and the knowledge of poetic knowledge. That is where the demonic plays. So when you consider what we're doing with our young people for the last 15 years now, we are leading the largest social experiment ever in the history of the world of what's going to happen to these people. And then what happens when the power goes out and you don't have the sparkly little box coming out of your pocket anymore. In your, your pocket anymore. The demonic can control the mind, not directly, but indirectly, by touching the imagination. And then if you think about taking individuals who only have been fed by screens psychologically since the time they're two, or even from birth, and it's easy. This is why mothers, even from the 60s, what did mothers do? Turn the TV on and park them in the living room because you drug them. You're, you're, you're mesmerizing the child. Put a video in. Put a DVD in. Go here, watch this. And you go put all, you know, the infinite number of Disney films so your children will shut up and stay in the family room so you can clean the rest of the house and start dinner. It's psychologically <coughs> equivalent of the imagination. It's the equivalent of having pumped them with some kind of morphine and they just sleep on the couch. Right? It's not chemical, but it's still an effect through the senses. And we forget these things. And so there is a huge aspect. Remember, St. Paul says that our battle is not with other human beings. It's not with men, flesh and blood. It's against the powers of this air. These beings that are all around us. And in the Syriac tradition, it's always kept this scriptural vision. You know, it's not angels are off someplace in some kind of light, light some, you know, glorious place where everyone's dancing around naked and playing harps. And then they come down here on occasion. The Syriac vision has always been the scriptural one, is these beings. These immaterial beings, they're always around them. Now, on their existential level, they are damned. They are in torment. They are unhappy individuals. All right? But they're around us in the sense of, it's not physicality, because they're not physical, but these are the powers of darkness that St. Paul portrays as being dragged behind in the triumphal parade of our Lord on the day of the resurrection. Yes? Demonic possession. Where does that fit in, in the imagination or...? No, it's probably, well, it depends on what it's manifesting as, but it's probably a control of the nervous system, physicality. So you make larynx, you make voices come out, you control the fit. Anything that is not the spirit is controllable by the spiritual world, okay? And in theory, for us too, we control the physicality of our lives. Right? We all know the aspects of the psychosomatic and all that. If you're depressed, then you're going to have all kinds of other problems coming in. You know, or if you have all kinds of other problems, you're going to be susceptible to depression. We know there's an interaction between them all the time. And so the question of possession, when it's actually a question, you know, it's a physicality of probably controlling the nervous system. Okay? But the devil can always play with our imaginations. If anything physical. All right? So this is the understanding, so why do we fast, all right? All right. So, I mean, if we want to finish up before we take a break, then, when we talk about the free will, this is the level, all right, of immateriality, all right? So this is the immaterial, when we talk about spirit, or in the Western tradition, we talk about soul, yes? Uh, we separated out two things. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the separation and how they link back up. So you said the soul was the source of life and the spirit was the breath of life. So what I'm wondering is, if I'm getting this correct, so this, is that the spirit breathes in the soul or the source of life, and then that uh, pathway that it used basically is that pathway so, to... So soul in a large sense is animation. Anything living as some interior principle of movement. You know, any physical thing can be moved, depending upon the force of the power. I mean, stones are rolled out in the street if you kick them, but they move by an external force. You know, it's when things move by an interior principle, an interior source, that's what we call animation in the large sense. In human beings, this aspect is immaterial that animates their life. But there's a juncture 
in the things that we do, when we talk about the body, this linking that takes place here, that funnel, as we talked about, at the cognitive sense. I mean, these are all coming out of imagination, <coughs> the senses, the bodies. These are all the places, this is where you, this is where you have you know, the, the, the photographic image of great-grandma, the wedding picture that's at home, and this is when you think of great-grandma, that picture comes up, you know, even if you never met the woman. You know, and that, these are where the images and everything functions at that level. It's part of our physicality, not part of the mind, strictly speaking, okay? At the level of the mind, it's when we say, okay, so here you have the image of your specific concrete great-grandmother, okay? But if we talk about the concept of grandmother, well, obviously there are more people than just that woman. And you strip away the images to have the conceptual idea of pater maternity two times removed. That type of a thing. You, then you talk about concepts. If I say to you, you know, if we talk about dogs, Doubtless you'll think about the dogs that you either have at home or dogs that you have had in your past life. But if we talk about dog as dog, and I ask you what color is dog, it's a ridiculous question because dog is something up here at the level of the mind functioning at our level of notions, ideas, and concepts. Fido, who was run over when I was five, traumatizing me, is down here as an image of what I remember him looking like, okay? So you notice the difference. Talking about dogs, or the dog I used to have, as compared to what the conceptual notion of dog is, are not the same thing, okay? So, at this immaterial level, when we talk about perception, this is where we have concepts and notions. Now, even the word concept, obviously our word conception. Conscipere in Latin literally means to take something in entirely. All right? And so, women's anatomical parts took in totally, and you have conception. And another little person appears in the world. Okay? But mentally, taking in all this information, the intellect perceives and conceptualizes, and therefore the expect the, the the process or the result not the process but the result of it we call a concept, that which is conceived in the mind. This is directly related to Saint John's usage in the New Testament of the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. That's why Saint Augustine then starts using his interiority of reflection on human consideration, talking about mind and conception, applying it to the Logos in what we have in Revelation and Scripture. All right? So this is where you have, let's use the green. So at the level of the mind, this is where we have dog as dog. Down here with imagination is where we have a dog or my doggy, okay? That's an image, that is, a, that is a picture that I have, but that's part of our physicality. The concept of dog is at a different level within us. Which is why even if you've never seen a dog, you can be given information and come to an understanding of what dog is as such, even if you've never experienced a dog. Which is why every single one of you, when I say unicorn, you know exactly what a unicorn is, even though you have never seen one or rode one. Because we can combine other conceptual ideas, and in a composite, call it unicorn, call it griffin, call it whatever, uh, chimera. You know, whatever these animals that we do, because we're combining, the mind can do these things, and the, imag the imagination can do these things. All right, so... The reason why we're doing this in complexity is there is a reason why we fast. A fast does not mean starve. A fast does not mean don't eat. Fast means discipline because we're disciplining. And what we'll, what we'll do when we come back after our caffeine break is the questions of
why, how, and when. All right. It could also, it could be what, but the what is this whole talk this evening, okay? Because if I just read this letter to the patriarch, we are so far away from our traditions, we have to relink why did our ancestors do this for centuries. If you read the simplistic books these days, it's like, oh, well, you know, they didn't really have much meat anyway. But that's not the reason why they fasted. Okay. Take a break, and we will have our sugar and caffeine. But Where I don't know from on? here to how far. And, and then, You're once ready to begin, uh, ladies. <laughs> All right. Ladies, oh, nice. the cold weather. Yeah. If I don't get a job. He's beginning. <laughs> what? No. Oh. oh. Sorry. Did anybody not get a pair of cards in their space? Because they're up here. I don't want to miss oh. anybody. Oh, I didn't give you one. Oh. No. no, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay, they forget. Chocolate chip. They forget. They forget. They forget. <laughs> All right. Thank you very so. much. <laughs> It's the reason why when we use the term fasting, or fast, it's a question of strengthening. Now, you can see it can I mean, for example, I'm talking about poetic knowledge, the way that we should be educating our children, which again, education just means to lead them out of immaturity to maturity. Education means to lead them, to lead them in their formation and their development, a dutre, from out of ex leading them out of immaturity toward maturity. And so these same Dominican teachers I used to work with, their motto was to educate through learning. In other words, to lead from immaturity while processing the mind and the will and the artistic sense. And so there was all the aspects of which you, you have to develop, not just simply um, the mind. So, in the whole development, when we talk about the poetic knowledge and talking about disciplining and not just simply allowing whatever our whims or caprices are about because we like sparkly stuff, and so to just to let your child just watch movies nonstop because that's what they want to do, of course it's what they want to do. That's what we do. That's why now that we can binge, we binge. And just sit for hours on end in front of the television or surf the web and just sit there for hours just going from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing and the next thing you know, four hours is gone. It's because if we're undisciplined, right, it's going to be, we weaken the will of our choosing. This is the whole reason for education, is it's a strengthening a human being's ability to choose freely what is the good and the beautiful and the true. This is the whole reason for education ultimately. Now for us, education in so many cases is just simply formatting someone for a specific job. That's not education, right? That's formatting. And so you can have, and I've known people who can go and finish and have their five years, six years, master's degree, and asking one of these people once, I have told you this one, I asked somebody once when World War I had been, this is six years of university, right? Plus 12 years of, of, of lower schooling. And I didn't even ask for the specific years. And they said, um, 19th century? Oh my god. No, I don't. It's like, no, that's the Civil War. And so that was really depressing. You know, because you know, anyway, I don't even go there. So necessarily there is discipline, there is a learning, there is a process of learning, which is why the idea of being ch -ch -ch disciplined is necessary in order to learn. Right? You know, we have the stories around in psychology books about having found feral children around. You find some child that must have been dropped off as an orphan in the woods of Austria or something, and in the 18th century this child is found. And some of them, when they find them, you know, they're late teenagers. And obviously had been out in the woods. I mean, this is the story of the foundation of Rome, right? Romulus and Remus. They're, they're, they're nursed by a she-wolf. But in the true stories of the feral children that are found, the children that are found that are already in adolescence, age-wise, as far as you can estimate, can speak. And they, uh, some of them never learned how to speak because they hadn't learned it at an earlier level of imitation. It's like we have the little guys squealing upstairs. Sometimes you'll hear them 
bring a sound in sync with whatever we're singing during the Mass. I'm reading a book right now by Kristen Hanna called The Magic Hour, and they're talking about this little girl that's been out in the wild. Yes, and so some of these feral children, when they would find them like at, if, you know, about the age as far as you can estimate that were like just children, like seven or eight, yeah. they can learn to some degree. You have one famous case in the psychology world where you had children who were neglected and the little girls had developed their own language. Yeah, this communication. So the human mind is very resilient. It will do what it can but only to a certain level. I and mean, once you've come to physical maturity, that's why you say some of these feral children, they actually never learn how to speak. They don't ever learn how to, to communicate in a human way. They can communicate, but they don't communicate in a human way. So this is very much, so that's on the last, so poetic knowledge, the level of what we do with our children, how we educate them, the training of your imagination, the training of your senses, the training of your physical body. I mean, now we're complaining because all of our children are obese. Well, of course they're obese. We let them just sit and watch screens. Of course you become obese, right? This is what happened. And so now, I mean, we didn't have obese children in 1910. There was too much to do. But now we allow this, and we render the greatest disservice to our children. That's why I say we are conducting the greatest human experiment ever in the history of the world, because we don't really know what all of these screens and everything else are doing to our children. We have all this research now going on the, just at the physical level, the plasticity of the human brain. <coughs> and we know that we rewire it, because without the studies and research, we know that after stroke, how do you learn how to speak again? You're not using the part of your brain that was destroyed in the stroke. Your brain doesn't rejuvenate that way, but it will recircuit around those damaged parts sometimes and you will walk again. Mm -hmm. But it's not using the part that had you walk. We know that. So how we can't link, and so actually some pediatricians are beginning to link, what is happening when all of your perceptions are only coming off of the two-dimensional screen in front of your face? And you know, don't even get us to the point of how you start working with virtual reality and this, you know, completely engulf your whole head and stuff. Alright? So the how, the why, the why is because it's the only way that we can learn. The feral child, again, these are exceptional cases, but they're fascinating to the scientific world and the teaching, you know, teachers, psychological world, because you now have somebody who's always been cut off, apparently, from any kind of human contact and human education, and in their feralness, you know, some of them lose the ability to humanly communicate. Now, so the idea of discipline or learning is absolutely essential, but you only discipline because you have a specific goal of what you're trying to learn. If you want to develop imagination, then you take away all the computers out of the children's hands and you give them a piece of rope and some blocks and they go play with that like children have always done from the dawn of creation. Because the imagination is a very resilient and very vibrant thing. The same way, I don't know why we don't link the two together, the same way children are just non-stop energy, and they're just always going normally, running, 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 playing, climbing, doing all these things, the, the imagination, the mind, they're always perceiving. It's the little guys in mass. I turn around, I do a blessing, I want to turn around, and he's looking at me and over the chair, and he goes, no, because he's doing what I'm doing at the altar. Right? And then he decides playing with Play-Doh again, because it doesn't last very long, because of the children. Right? But that's how we start absorbing things, and that's how your children learned the faith when they were little. But of course, if you were one of the families in 1982 that only went to Mass once every three months, your children never perceived it, because they just never saw it. Right? So the question of discipline, that's why I always try to bring it back to the meaning of the word, it's learning. What are we trying to learn? <coughs> what are we trying to perceive? All right? So that's the question is, is, why do we try to strengthen ourselves? We try to strengthen ourselves because we are trying to be open to learn something. That's why we fast. We strengthen ourselves so that we have learning so that we can be open. So, in other words, the how and the when is the rest of this letter, right? That we have periods of strengthening, we have periods of 
fasting throughout the 12 months of the calendrical year. And the patriarch is reminding us of this. So with the when and the how is what comes in. So that's why when we began this whole thing, I wanted to put down the tripartite division of body, mind, and spirit. Because the why is what are we doing in disciplining through food of how and when we eat? It's precisely so that the spirit and the mind do not become shackled and chained to my animalistic senses and passions. We liberate it by ordering these things. Go back to the idea that if you never develop your imagination, you're going to have one heck of a time actually developing your human mind, the spirit. Not because the spirit does, but because the spirit can't be exercised. It's because you're paralyzing. You are, um, uh, what's the word for it now? Um, Atrophy. You're atrophying the imagination. And when you do that, I mean, human beings are physical and spirit. They are material and immaterial. The linking part, as far as knowledge goes, is that imagination. If you atrophy the imagination, you know, that feral children, that feral child who never learned how to speak in, you know, the case of the 18th century, what, Austria, wherever it was at, it didn't mean that the child didn't have a larynx doesn't mean the child didn't have an immortal soul. But it never developed in discipline to become fully operational as a human being. All right? So the noose, this is at the level of the, if you want, that kind of edge of just pure immateriality. It means the mind. And it's, it really is where for the Greeks and the Greek philosophy, they would link this level here of perception. Reasoning you also develop of the mind, how to link properly, all right? Or learn the field, the science of logic, formal logic, material logic. But the level of concept, dog, notion, these ideas that we have, this is the level of the noose perception. It's what we also call intuitive knowledge, okay? Intuition. I'm right, I need a bigger board. Now, so this is reasoning. In Latin, it's what we call ratio genatio. Just reasoning. A plus B equals C, C equals D, and therefore A plus E equals D. Yes, because we link, if C and D are identical, then E and B must also be identical to D. That's reasoning, okay? That is something specifically human because we work through sense information. The angels do not reason. That's why it's not really correct when we call angels um, reasonable beings. And saying God is a reason, God is not a reasonable being. They're all intelligent beings. But intelligence and reasoning are not the same thing. Right? Intelligence is at this level of the use of perception. And are you ready? Intelligence. It's from the words into lejere. Intellectus. What is literally read inside. Intus is inside. Lejere is to read. Intus lejere. We don't have the word in English, intelligize. Well, I do, because I taught philosophy long enough that we just use it, because we need this word. The intellect, the faculty, the power of the human being intelligizes, the intellect intelligizes, and that action is our intelligence. Okay. But the word literally, the fundamental meaning of intelligize or intellect and all that, is intus legere. Even the word intellect means, like we talked about concept, the word intellect actually means the end result of intelligizing. Because we have the word intus lectus, L-E-C-T-U-S. That word means red, R-E-A-D, red where our word lectionary comes from. It's the combining of readings. All right? Having read with it, having been read into with it, 
That's the meaning of the word intellect. And that's the human ability, not just simply to know the fire hydrant as a place to pee on, but to know the fire hydrant as fire hydrant and to understand that it is part of a water system that is there that will put fire on at your house, that has to be sustained, that means maintenance, that an engineer designed. The dog will never perceive fire hydrant as a fire hydrant because it doesn't have intellect. It will mark it as part of its physical territory, so it will pee on it and pee on it every time it moves by, especially if another dog has been there, to kind of identify their place. But that's why when we talk about intelligence, it's at the level of the human being, which you don't do when you're two. But you develop, this is why we keep coming back to talking about the age of reason. When you start perceiving things as they are in themselves, when you are three, you don't pilfer cookies if mom's around. Not because you understand pilfering cookies before dinner is bad, it's because you don't want your hand slapped. So that's all you know. But when it comes to the point where you're understanding pilfering cookies is not what I'm supposed to be doing bad, and you develop a moral sense, then you don't do it whether mom's there or not. And that's why when you have people who in their lives never develop a moral sense, they will do whatever they can get away with. And of course, that is, I just got the book by Dr. Michael Stone on the anatomy of evil. Really interesting. So anyways, what do you do with psychopaths? People who at the level of the body and the senses do not have emotional empathy. That's a whole other thing. And it becomes freaky if they start talking about, you know, a quarter of the population being psychopathic in their physical makeup. But they don't all do things which are psychopathic because they've been educated by people who have taught them discipline. But you'll notice what he does in this book is he deals with the kind of ser serial torturings of a kind of new kind of crime which has developed really since the 60s. Which would be in effect that if you have biologically, you know, 20% or a quarter of the population who just biologically don't, they have a hard time with emotional connection. And we talk about autism, you know, we this kind of connection with other people, when we talk about biologically, that's what we mean by the psychopath. They are ill at the level of the mind, psyche. Psyche is the mind, pathos is sickness. When you say psychopath, it means that they, on the level of the mind, they are ill. That's all it means, they have mental illness. But, it, but we make this specific mental illness be the lack of empathy, and these people we call psychopaths. And we associate it with murders, because they don't have the connection, and so, these other people are just objects. Yes? Isn't it that that portion of the brain that has the empathy isn't actually active? We don't know activated? exactly why. <coughs> we don't know yet. I mean, they're doing research to try to figure out what's going on. But they do know that people who have brain scans are biologically psychotic. But, you know, they have a business and a, and, and, and a spouse and children, and they do fine. Because the other parts of their life have been disciplined, and so they've learned how to act, even if they don't feel anything with the other people. I was telling Steve the other day, I first came across this when, back in the early 90s when they had the, they had the book and that movie came out, The Silence of the Lamb. Oh, yeah. Oh. So, <laughs> when you have, when you have, but you have, but they do, they, we weren't really discussing psychopathy unless you were a professional at the time, culturally. But you have that one scene where he goes and that girl is in the pit. And he keeps talking to her as it. It will take this out of the bucket. It will do this. You know, as she's cussing and screaming at him. But it's precisely the interviews with John Wayne Gacy, who killed whatever, these 30 young men. He will always refer to them as it. You will find, you will find it under the back patio or under the whatever. But they, because of that lack of ability. But again, it doesn't mean that you become a criminal, but it's a, there's a biological makeup here. So that's why I'm saying is that what happens here, if you don't actually discipline or try to train, and you think education is just simply to transmit data, facts, memorize this, that's not education anymore. The transmission of, of statistics and data are only part of what you do to form the human mind. Which is why we fast. It's part of the discipline of our physical 
bodies. Yes. One interesting thing I remember hearing about psychopaths as well, where they, they may have a detachment to people, a lot of times they have a lot, they do have empathy towards animals. I haven't come across that, but it's, I guess it's possible. Well, here's a good example. So, Father, let me, let me try and restate why we fast, mm -hmm. and you tell me if I'm right. We fast to strengthen, to learn, discipline, to make choices so my spirit is not shackled to my bodily impulse. And so ultimately, by doing that, when we are masters of our lower existence, our bodies, our emotions, our, our, our emotions, our senses, when we have that, then it necessarily means that the mind is being able to open up to the inspirations and the graces of God. So when your body is sort of di directing you here If your body is directing you, then you are completely oblivious to what God is saying to you, which puts you on the path to damnation. We say that the doctrine is God gives everyone sufficient help to save their souls in the sense of, you know, saving souls. But it doesn't mean everyone necessarily is capable of hearing that because of whatever turmoil they've gone through in their life. So, you know, do these things happen? Is it, who knows? Because we don't know. It's all closed to us. But the same way that we can, we can complain about whatever we want about the Austrian people who obviously biologically bred this child in the 18th century, who for whatever reasons, maybe they died, they were peasants and they just died, and this child was just left out and then survived. Whatever we want to complain about, that child still never learned how to speak, even at the age of 30. The child never learned how to speak, whatever the reason is going on to it, it's the same thing. If we don't have discipline, this is why fasting is so important, is that that child never learned how to speak, and if we don't learn how to discipline our lower nature so that the mind is open to God, we cripple ourselves just as realistically as that child who will never learn how to physically speak. Yes. Um, one that's kind of a different perception of this, I, when I was a teenager taking ballet, I was anorexic and bulimic. So this kind of explains why the anorexia and bulimia can be very attractive because you're basically learning how to control your body's impulses and there's that sense right, of But of course the link that makes it an illness is right. the, it's the, the, the distorted perception. Right. So you always see, your, even at 98 pounds, you still see yourself as being fat. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole different aspect that comes up. But this is exactly why when our Lord says in the Gospel, if you do not do penance, you will surely perish. If you don't, and sacrifice, of course, we use the word, which means pain and offering it up. But actually, the word sacrifice is just to make something holy, sacru fachure. And so our, our fasting is to strengthen us so that we are open to learning and discipline so that we render all things sacred by sacrifice, sacrum fatrile, within our human existence open, and therefore open to grace. That's ultimately what makes it sacred. Okay? But that's why, too, in the last 50 years of reducing religion down to emotionality and sentimentality, we have, we have strangled people in the, in the world of grace. Because emotions, you know, everyone knows by experience, emotions, how long do they last? Well, it depends, you know. You know. You can't even make it through all Thanksgiving Day joyously, you know, it's just, it's nice, and then, and then, and then like, can't this guy, you know, why doesn't Uncle Joe just leave? He knows he's causing everyone pain. So, you know, how long does emotional feel, feelings just don't, you can't build anything out of them. Yes? Where on that would emotions fit in? Down here. In the imagination is where the emotions They're not are. Imagine, they are not imagination, but they are the sense reactions to what we're perceiving around us. Bodily. Yeah, they're all bodily. Okay. And so when you break them down, and we've talked about anger numerous times, anger is just a perception of something that is in proximity to me, which I consider to be evil, and a big evil. Okay. When it's far away from me, what I consider to be bad or evil, when it's far away from me, it causes fear. But when it's present to me, now it's anger. Because I have to overcome it. And so, you know, it can bring all kinds of other things up. It can mean I don't sleep before the exam the next day. Or that I decide this professor really is an ass. You know, the professor has nothing to do with what's going on. But I'm angry because I'm reacting to this test. 
So that's what I'm perceiving as being evil. But someone who's not perceiving as being evil sleeps that night and has been, you know, studying for the last eight weeks of, of the term, and so they're fine. And so sometimes we create, oftentimes I have to say, we create our own evil, what we perceive as being evil, okay? We've created them, either directly or indirectly. And our lives are just constantly consequences of things we've chosen from earlier. Right, so the students that you have who just discipline themselves and study throughout the term, they do fine, right? And the kids who are just over at Silver Street Tanner who've been drinking and they want to show for the exam, right? Because they never learned strengthening, they never learned to fast, and so they don't learn how to learn. But what we've done culturally is we say everybody has to go to university. Which of course is also absurd. It's a very specific form of, of formation to go to university. To say that everyone should go is the equivalent of saying every male should be a wood carpenter. Why? I mean, you should have some basic manual skills, but why should everyone be a trade carpenter? So everyone should go to university. University were for the, precisely, intellectual trades, professions, you know, at that level. Anyway. So we have a big problem that goes on at all levels. So we don't start anywhere if I don't personally have the ability to discipline. If I can't discipline my life, what do I give to the people around me as a family? And if my family doesn't know how to fast, then what the heck is the neighborhood going to be like? Or what the heck is the town going to be like? This is why in the modern world today, just on this, from this angle, why everyone's in hysterics. Because ultimately, we've lived in a culture now for at least 50 years which have never really learned how to discipline ourselves. I think it's fascinating because I'm looking through the newspapers, and when you see they'll come out, you know, this high school, that high school, and they come out with their top 10 students, who's valedictorian, who's salutatorian. And what's absolutely fascinating, but not surprising, is almost every single one of those 10 kids is the son of Joan and John something or other. There's always two parents there. Usually, right? the they're there, and they're, and so they're telling you that this child has come out of something that was stable, disciplined, and fasting. If you want to use this term, it is a strengthened situation, and therefore this child had the full benefit of being led from immaturity to maturity, and now they're situated to go on well. Okay, now. That's all of, you know, this is the foundation of why we have, the, and why I keep coming back to this letter, because I think it's brilliant that the patriarch is trying to make us, he doesn't give reasons why, and I realized last week that I'm just reading this, what is meat, what are red meats, what are white meats, I'm just giving you, you know, the what down here. But the why of really why we do this, you know. And so when someone learns that fast, Wednesday and Fridays of the week. They don't have a problem going to the Mass on Sunday. Why wouldn't I go before the Divine Mysteries to perceive the very life that I'm trying to discipline in my prayer life, morning prayers, night prayers, and in that discipline that I made myself? Right? Fasting Wednesdays and Fridays was not a long time ago, right? And so it's only been in this last lifetime, in a sense, if we use Dean FIFA as a lifetime expense, it's only been in the period of one life that we've let all of this just collapse. You know, and that's why I say even when we've retained, because the church could never say you never have to fast and you never have to do discipline. So we've reduced it down to two holy days in the Latin church, Good Friday and Ash Wednesday. But if you don't do diddly squat for 363 days, how realistically are you really going to eat one meal on that Wednesday? You know, how well are you going to make it till noon if from the time you've woken up on the other last 363 days, you start pumping food into this orifice? Right? So it's just logic. Did they give up Wednesday the same time they gave up Friday? Who? Vatican with the church. No, well, we, we mentioned last week, remember that, you know, the Latins fasted during the Advent season, you know, the four weeks of Advent, 
um, Wednesdays and Fridays. It was abolished. That was abolished at the beginning of the 20th century. But most but throughout of our the year, no. Throughout the year, they dropped that a long time ago. But most of our childhood was Friday. Yes. Friday, Friday, Friday. Yeah, absolutely. When was Wednesday disregarded? Well, the Latins dropped that a long time ago. Well, read the Patriot. You read the Patriarchs. No, it was never dropped by the Maronites. We right. just dropped it. I mean, it was never dropped. But the Latins had specific decisions. They dropped the fast of Wednesdays and Fridays during Advent. But you know, they fasted still Monday through Saturday until fairly recently, with a huge amount of dispensations depending upon what diocese you lived in. I mean, I've come across books in the 1950s where the bishops were dispensing for George Washington's birthday. <laughs> which always lands in February, it's almost always Lent, and they'll just dispense you from them. Well, why? You Were know? you here for St. Patrick's Day when the bishop in Portland gave them the ability to eat corned beef and cabbage oh, that Friday? Because it landed on a Friday. <laughs> yes. Do you remember that? Well, because, te because technically St. Patrick just wouldn't be there. It's not part of the common canon of the Latin church. And so the bishop would have to give that dispensation or, yeah. or the parish priest for his parish to be able to eat it technically. I thought that was really ridiculous. Yeah. So, well... We, well, if you're Irish... But this is why when you return to this whole thing, I mean, there are reasons why we have fasted. And the idea of Wednesday and Friday, I mean, this predates Christianity. You know the story of the publican and the Pharisee when he goes in. The Pharisee says, he says... I fast twice in the Sabbath. That's what the term actually says. That's why this translation that we use is more of an interpretation of the scriptures. It doesn't necessarily say exactly what the scriptures are saying. But when the Pharisee is standing there and he says, I tithe, I give 10% of everything that I own. I fast twice in the Sabbath, meaning I fast twice in a week. What he's referring to is the Pharisees, what the Jews were doing at the time of our Lord. They fasted on Tuesday and Thursday of each week. Friday evening began the Shabbat to the Saturday evening. So the fast was on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So the Christians, shortly after that, shifted it to Wednesday and Friday. One, to make a distinction that we're not Jews. And two, because Wednesday is the day by tradition that Judas went to the temple authorities to sell our Lord. So you make reparation for that treason on Wednesday. And of course, Friday is the day of the death of our Lord. So that's why it shifted to Wednesday and Friday. Like I said, in many places, the clergy will fast Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Okay? Then it becomes the question of, well, what is the fast? And that's what the patriarch was dealing in this first section. Hmm? So the question is... No, when you say fast, you're not going to eat anything, right? Well, that's... a well, in English, we call that a black fast. If you're going to go a day and not actually eat anything, that's a black fast, which is what doctors require you for colonoscopies, right? So when you fast, you're going to eat only Which, thanks be to God, I only know by reputation and not by experience. <laughs> yes. So when I'm fasting, I only eat one meal a day? Oh, uh, yeah. So when we come back, so the, yeah, so the patriarch is giving us what we have in this section. We'll try to finish it up. Yes. So we began by talking about in this section about what we were calling in English white meats, red meats. So the red meats are flesh, anything flesh. Scallops are flesh. All right? So any flesh meat is red meat. All right? White meats in the understanding ecclesiastically, because we told you white means food. That's what we did last week. So white meat referred to all animal products. And that's where you got milk, butter, eggs, cheese, all the things that are animal products. So essentially, that's why I just used the term to put it in a nutshell, is that when you fast, you're vegan. <laughs> because everyone basically understands vegan these days is no animal products, okay? No animal flesh, no animal products, nothing from animals, okay? So, that's what we did, and then of course we talked about that during the Lent, during the Great Lent, there were five, well for us it's four, because number three is St. Joseph anyway, you had four, we have four days during the Lenten season that will not be part of a fast, you know. And so those are listed in that second paragraph. Then, of course, in paragraph 22, the patriarch brought up the fact that you use common sense. People are sick, people are elderly. You do what common sense tells you to do so that you sustain your health. It's not for you to die by fasting. 
But again, I said in a fasting mentality, you know, so I need to eat to take this medication. That's a perfectly legitimate thing. But it's a difference between eating a handful of almonds because I need something in my stomach and sitting down and eating a burger. I mean, there's a difference when I say, you know, what do I actually need to do to take with this medication so it doesn't burn a hole in my stomach or whatever these things are. I just heard a horrific NPR broadcast on Fresh Air about all of this, the, 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 the generic drugs that are made oh, in I just India. Read that. that was horrific. So anyways, that's it. Okay. And it was horrifying. So, how, yes. how, how difficult would it be to get this in the Maronite calendar so that, you know, when it will you, always, these dates will always be in the bulletins. I mean, I, you know, like, but I announce, you know, no, when, when the, the, the bishop puts out that calendar, it would be really neat. You could easily put them in, yes. You could. Well, right in there. I will. Say, next year's calendar, are you going to put these dates in? I will. In? I will do that. So, that, Luna doesn't have to write it up in the bulletin all the time, and nobody reads anyways. Can you just give us that <laughs> in, in, into the calendar? Steve. Yeah, no, because they put fish in already. Steve. So that doesn't come from the bishop. What? It doesn't come from the bishop. Our calendar doesn't. No, it's Catholic. Do um, Catholic do extension. Eat? Yeah. So you do vegetables. You can do bread. Anything that is not an animal product. Bread salons that has no butter. They have a marinate version right. of that. Right. Yeah, you don't have butter. You can have toast, but with no butter. But you could use margarine because it's oil. It's vegetable oil. Oh, and you can have oil. You can have vegetable oil. It's vegetable. Yeah. So that's why I've said if you really want to know how to do this. You know, you can write to the, the Greek Orthodox monastery in Brookline, Massachusetts, and they make an Orthodox cookbook. And you have all of your Lent and recipes in there. And as I mentioned, because you have feast days during Lent, you know, when it says that you don't fast on the Feast of St. Joseph, it means you can eat in the morning. You don't have to wait until noon. And it also means that you can eat, you know, as often as you want during the day, technically. But you're still going to be vegan. So in that cookbook, you have recipes for bread and, and cookies, and you have things that are in there that could be considered festive, because, but, but they're still made. So they'll, they have a recipe in there, so you, can't use, you don't use um, butter. So they do a sesame seed wash for lime things, so that you can bake and get them out of the pan. So anyways, it's Brookline, Massachusetts, Holy Transfiguration Monastery. I should get commissions for all the books I recommend from that monastery. Yes? Is Bishop Mansour going to um, promote this or um, oh, I mean, you know, encourage? The patriarch is promoting it. But I, I you know, as far as the bishop himself. Or... He's a gentle soul. And I don't think, you know, anything that would make people squirm, I think he'd be uncomfortable with. I, on the other hand, I like, I, because if we look farther on the benefit that comes from this, you know, this is something definitely, I mean, I, I, like I told you last year when I read this, I just went out of food, I thought, this is, this is glorious. I haven't heard an ecclesiastic talk about a tradition like this in, you know, God knows how many years. So it's beautiful. I mean, it's beautiful. So it's, you know, the diet, as we mentioned in this first section, winds up becoming, and so the last part that he has in that section for the great length, he says, look, even if you can't do anything during seven weeks, because I'm just too weak. He says in that last paragraph, given life's demands, and to alleviate the burden of the faithful. This is why you have to begin to extricate yourself from the Latin church. We are not Latin. It reminds me of I used to go up and say Mass in Alaska. And I'd be in Anchorage, and the people would come to the Mass. Hall, but we weren't there all the time to say Mass. It was just a mission. We'd come, you know, like twice in a month or something. And in the other weeks, these Latins didn't just want to go to their local parish, so they used to go to St. Luke's Byzantine Catholic Church. And the poor father there at one point finally just kind of lost it, and he said to the people, and he says, look, you're coming to St. Luke's, I understand. You normally go to Mass at St. Teresa's, and that's great, and you are welcome to be here. But if you're coming to St. Luke's, you need to be following St. Luke's traditions because they weren't fasting during Lent. They were doing you know, this kind of wishy-washy Latin thing. And so it was great. So they told me that story one weekend. They came in and said, oh, yeah, Father's sermon was really strong last week. And he said, we really should be embracing the Byzantine disciplines. I said, well, if you're going to the Byzantine church, you should. Mm -hmm. The problem for us mentally is we are Latins. Even if we were born Maronites, our mentality is so Latinized it's, it's shocking, which is why it's shocking when a Maronite reads this, like, whoa, but I've always had a big fish sandwich on Friday, you know, 
I know, uh, during Lent. And it's like, well, that's fine. You may have been doing that. It's like the one lady telling me in Lebanon. When I grew up, growing up in Lebanon in the 60s and the 70s, we were eating fish and fry. And they said, yeah, that's a lot of influence. Because she was looking at this in the Maronite voice and looking at this. These prescriptions were in the Maronite voice for the Lent. And she's reading this, and it's like, well, this is all, wow, this is new. So the big thing is, is forget what the Latins do. Read the Patriarch's letter. Forget. Because, you know, but does not... That's like the whole abstinence thing on Friday. For, read what the patriarch is saying, which is why he says here, to alleviate the burden of the faithful, the law of fasting and abstinence. Okay, so the, here fasting is dealing with the question of how much we eat, and abstinence is dealing of what we eat, quantity and quality. So in the English that we're using here, fasting is referring to quantity. Fat, abstinence is referring to the type of food we eat. But technically, when we fast, you know, the, the, the English Latin idea of abstinence, fast and abstinence, okay, so you fast, but you can have your, you know, you go out for sushi, right? And it's glorious. You may not order sake because it's Lent, but it, you have a great time. You know, and, and, you know, deep down we understand, you know, what, what part of discipline is this really going on? And within me, I mean, there's some. I mean, this is the important thing. Remember, the why, the how, and the when requires this discipline by the fact that I have to think about these things. I think about which days I'm going to apply myself consciously, rather than just eating like an animal at a feeding trough. I mean, how many Americans just live like animals? We just pump food into our face every time my stomach says, EAT! And so we start pumping food in. Which is why we all water around with super gulps through the airport. It's just, I don't, this is not going to finish well as a culture and as a nation because we're just, we're completely out of it. Men, but all of that doesn't indicate the fact that just because we have a problem at uh, that level of eat, it's indicating we have a much more profound problem at the level of mind and free will. And the power goes out. What do we do now when the power goes out? We loot. What used to happen when the power went out? Well, we went out, we pulled it, we pulled the sofa out to the front porch to stoop, and you know, because it was too hot inside the house, and then we visited with the neighbors. Now we ransacked the neighbors and the neighboring businesses. It's indicating there are huge problems going on here because of this lack of the ability for discipline. So that's why what the patriarch says in this last paragraph, he says, all right, to alleviate this burden in the modern world, but he still tells us that this fasting and abstinence is still mandatory during the first week and the last week of Lent. Forget about Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. He's telling you the first week of Lent, <coughs> the whole week, Monday through Friday, and during Passion Week, the last week of Lent, are also fast, Monday through Friday, with an encouragement actually on the last one to go till noon on Saturday. And those who are unable to comply may consipate, com compensate for fasting and abstinence with good deeds and works of charity. So he's saying that even if you need to not do the food part of this, you're still obliged to do something extra disciplining yourself. Go to the nursing home and help. Volunteer doing something. Go work in the soup kitchen. Do something that, all right, you don't eat what you need to eat, but do something that's still disciplining you in this learning. All right, that's why the second section is our next fast coming up is next month, in June. This is always the great one. You remember the fast for Saints Peter and Paul? Mm. Or vaguely? No. Okay. So we, these are very classic. Uh, we, we fasted mostly in the month of May, about the Blessed Mother, in October, and then in the nine days of Novena at Christmas time. Okay, so in this section here, the rest of the letter you can, you can kind of go through. I just have a few points that I want to I indicate to you. So the fast of Saints Peter and Paul is next month. We fast from the 17th to the 28th of June. Yeah. Again, on Saturdays and Sundays you eat as much as you want, but it's still vegan. Okay? So the feast of Saints Peter and Paul is on June 29th. It's a Saturday this year. Okay? It's at the end of now. I will see you on that day. And the Twelve Apostles is the next day on June 30th. 29th and 30th. 
Those are the two feasts that we prepare for by fasting. We prepare for all of the great feasts by disciplining ourselves to open ourselves of the noose to grace and illumination. Okay? So that's why for the great apostles, the princes of the apostles, Peter and Paul, we fast from June 17th and 28th, which is why the patriarch puts down, it's called the Apostles Fast, during which the faithful abstain, fasting, eating meat, dairy products, eggs, it's the fast. Okay? It's a normal fast, just like Lent. The third one, so we have two big fasts and two little fasts throughout the 12 months. We have two big Lents and two little Lents. So St. Peter and Paul is one of the little Lents, and the Dormition Fast, or the Fast of the Virgin Mary, number three there in paragraph 24, this Dormition Fast, and the Dormition, the Assumption. So the first year when I came here, and we had the Feast of the Assumption, and you know, 20 of you came to Mass. It's like, the Assumption is the Maronite Marian Feast. We celebrate it with fireworks in the Middle East. <laughs> If you go out to the, fat, the Assumption pilgrimage to our shrine in Ohio, it's, it goes on for three days. Monday is Latin day. They invite a Latin priest to come. He does mass and everything. Tuesday is Byzantine day. All the Ukrainians come from Pittsburgh. And then on the Maronite, the feast itself on the 15th, the Maronites have it. You have two processions. The Byzantines do one. The 15th, we do another one. At the end of the Maronite procession on that evening of the 15th, we have fireworks over the top of the shrine. So I said, if you get a chance, go. Monsignor Spinoza puts on a good show. Okay? And you have the sisters there, and they sing the the. Um, the ya the, uh, yeah, yeah, the singing ya Allah. So the yeah, blessing with the icon. And one of the sisters came out beautiful. And she just stands in front of the mic and she sings this whole hymn just alone while the bishops do the icon blessings of the crowds. Yeah. And then when it's all done, the fireworks go off. And then there's a huge buffet. Because now it's time to eat. <laughs> right? Because the 14th and the 13th are still part of the fast. So, you know. And so when I got here, and 20 people show up for the Feast of Dormition because, well, we're at camp, it's like, huh? <laughs> it's like, whoa. So the fast, notice that he gives us the dates there. It's, it's that last week, August 7th, after the Transfiguration, up through the 14th. And the fast of Christmas, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. We don't fast at Christmas. Christmas starts in November. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Announcements Advent. is not, announcements is not, we don't do Advent, we do announcements. But announcements is not Christmas. We only do announcements as Christmas because Macy's from October has been telling us it's Christmas. And we completely succumb to the commercialism. So it's a reminder here. We used to fast the, the 14 days before yes. December 16, That's and right. we were here every night. For devotions, because there's a novena. novena. There's a novena. And the Bishop Gregory, who asked the question, he wants the Christmas novena to either be sustained or resurrected. But, you know, I don't know how long ago it, it, it We were doing it in Fall River. And it was always amazing because some of the immigrants who never came to Mass, they'd come for the Christmas novena. Yeah. Yeah. And you'd see, oh, okay, the rest of the year, we're <laughs> on. All right? So, that's your Christmas novena. Now, of course, in antiquity, we used to fast the whole season of the announcements, from the beginning of the first Sunday of announcements, for five weeks, just like the seven weeks of the, the other great Lent. But from the, 18, the 1700s, from the 18th century, it's been limited down, and he gives you the dates. December 16th, ending on December 24th. Now, because in America, where, wherever the custom comes from, we basically celebrate Christmas Eve and Christmas as being the same thing. The fast for Americans starts earlier. We start on December 15th, and the fast will end on the 23rd because of the way Americans celebrate. And that's what we do in the FRP. Okay? But we're still vegan. We're still vegan from December 15th to December 23rd. And if our people had thought in these terms when all of your offices were having their Christmas parties, and we started saying, well, I'd love to, but it's actually going to be during our fast, you hear what? 
We would have evangelized. It's like all the kids who started going to soccer in 1994. It's the reason why you know, everything's scheduled on Sunday morning. Now. If the Catholics had said, sorry, my boys are not coming for soccer, why? Because it's Sunday morning. We're going to be at church. We'll get a mass. Hello. It wouldn't have happened. Yeah. I think, Father, the critical thing is, is that the fast isn't because the church is telling us we must do something. Yeah, because it does this to you. It's because it strengthens us and makes us better people. Yeah, it it's a good thing. It's yeah, a healthy it thing. It opens but you know, you hear so many Catholics say, "I'm not doing that." I don't, you know, because they you don't want to get better. You don't want to be a better person. Yeah, because they were reared in legalism. You do it because you're told to do it. Right. Exactly. And I understand that, which is why I give you these absolutely tedious, enormously long explanations of stuff. And then they go, "That's too complicated." It's like, look, <laughs> what do you expect me to do then? That's why most priests said you do it because the church tells you to do it. Right. That's, that's why you got the legalism because everyone was going. That's too complicated. Why is he so... It's too much. And it's right. like, well, you can't have it both ways. Right. And in the end, if you, you know, if the teachers just give up, then, of course, we, everything falls apart. So, all right. Okay. So that's why he reminds us about our abstinence on Fridays. Now, notice in paragraph 26, I don't have to read them to you. He says the refraining from eating meat and dairy products. Notice that our fast on Friday is a fast. So every Friday of the year is still vegan. And then he gives you a huge list here of when these different feasts, there's 18 of them in that paragraph. I don't need to read them to you. But our, for us, that's why I say forget about what the Latins are doing. Throughout the entire year, we are vegan. We fast every Friday all year round, except for the Fridays that fall on all these feast days. Yes? Well, if the calendar can't be you know, if it ends up that it can't be made that the feast, that the fast days are on there, then maybe right with the calendar can be put just a single sheet of what fast days. Oh, I think I think if people wrote in Aspen, they will adapt. I mean, we put little fish in them, so I mean, we can certainly put down indications for the proper patriarchal fast. All is right, there, is there a symbol for fasting? Like fish is that? No, we just put the fish for abstinence. Right. Maybe it's darker. Maybe it's a darker color. I don't know. I don't pay attention to that calendar. You can eat fish though. Or is that considered animal? On Fridays? On uh, whatever. No, whenever it's a fast, there's no there's no animal so product. You can't eat fish, but right. that's what we used to eat, fish and that's eggs on Latin. Which is, which that's is, Latin. Because that's the influence from the Latin. Which is even in Lebanon, when Bodhi brought it up. She was saying we were also doing that in Lebanon. But that's again, you know. But the patriarch is clearly going, okay, everybody, <laughs> pulling us back to what our proper tradition is. All right, let's finish up so we can let you get out of here. The Eucharistic fast, it needs a little bit of explanation. Now, notice paragraph 27, he says, abstaining from food from at least an hour, it's the same thing as the Latin, an hour, from food at least an hour before the Divine Liturgy, an hour before receiving communion, in addition to, you know, if you're at home, or, you know, <coughs> for whatever reason, so an hour before receiving communion, in addition to prepare ourselves to be in a state of grace, takes you back to the beginning part of this bulletin about going to confession. And also, wear decent clothes! <laughs> You're presenting yourself before the altar. The guy my left, oh, thank goodness someone's finally saying this again. Flip-flops, shorts, and tank tops are not decent clothes before the Lord. Or yeah. short skirts where you can see what color someone's on the Yeah, list. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the idea is, you know, there was a reason why throughout the centuries, people who were dirt poor, you know, for most of the history of the world, most people have been poor peasants. They are not King Edward of England. Most people just have their, their two-room house, shelter, a field to work in, and a lot of kids. But they had a set of clothes to present themselves before the Lord on Sunday. And for most people, it was looked forward to because the rest of the day, I'm just in my, the rest of the week, I'm just in my normal scrubs to work in the fields or my, my forge or whatever it is. They looked forward to looking more human. Now, it's like you want to put a tie on someone, and they're like the puppy, you know, screaming, you know, when you put the leash on for the first time to take them for a walk. It's like, you're not going to die. So anyway, so there's three points in that paragraph. One is the question of the fast before receiving, before the Mass, before Divine Liturgy. Two is to have a conscious awareness of where we are morally before God, the state of grace. 
you know, foresty. We make <coughs> make these announcements before funerals, and if we ever have weddings, we'll make it before weddings also saying, well, we welcome all Catholics who are in state of grace. And as he brought up one text, I don't even know if they know what the state of grace means. But, and I said, this is probably true, but we still have to make the announcement. That's a different problem. Because that means I'm a good person, and so I'll just go up. So, and then the third one is, of course, we present ourselves in a very respectful and proper way. Now, what I wanted to just finish with and bring up on this is that up, uh, this idea of the hour fast before the Mass is from 1965. Up until 1955, 55, 1920th century, up until 1955, we retained what was called the apostolic fast where there was no food or even drink, including water, from midnight until you received communion. You remember that? I remember that. Yeah, so. The only problem is a lot of priests became alcoholics because the first thing in their system was alcohol. Well, they mean they received communion first, but. So the thing is, no, that wasn't, the, that's a different issue. That's a different issue. We used to wait on table till midnight, and then we couldn't eat. We'd get out really hungry, yeah. and all we wanted sometimes was just a hot dog. But I think I, I've told you so. We couldn't eat. So there, when I was working in Missouri, there was an older gentleman there back in the late 80s. And he had grown up on a Missouri farm. I mean, they were still using a buggy. And they would go to Mass, and Mass took them almost an hour to get to on a buggy, okay? They lived on the farm. His mother would get up, her mother on Saturday night would put a gauze, she'd put a little sack over the pump in the kitchen of the farmhouse. So nobody got up by accident just to get a glass of water so they could go to communion the next day. And then he talked about, so now you're in this buggy in the Missouri summer, ooh, humidity. And you're going to go an hour just to get to Mass. I mean, talk about discipline. <laughs> so he talked about, what he talked about is a great sense of achievement. And I did that as an 8-year-old. I did that as a 10-year-old. You know, when people achieve greatness because they are a disciplined life, everyone's proud of that. So it's important to remember, right? The beginning of the 20th century, the Alliance went, no more Advent fast. 1955, oh, we'll get rid of the apostolic fast of the Eucharist. We'll make it only three hours. And so in 1955, it was reduced to three hours before Mass. No food or drink, alcoholic drink. You could have a juice or a milk two hours before. And of course, you could always have water. Right? So they changed that. And Pius XII said, he wrote in this letter, that in alleviating the, the apostolic fast, to make it easier in the modern world. We keep saying the modern, poor moderns can't do anything. So in the modern world to alleviate it, he said, though we should augment and increase our works of devotion and charity to pre replace what we're not doing in our discipline of the apostolic fast. So that was up until 1955. That was changed in 55 because we started having evening masses in the late 50s. And there's no way you're gonna go from midnight on Thursday until you go to a first Friday mass at 7 p.m. on the Friday with absolutely nothing, including water. That's a black fast, right? Yeah. All right, so we just wanted to give you those two notes. All the way up until 1955, then we shifted. And of course, the Maronite shifted then. And that only lasted 10 years. Then we did an hour. And since that time, does anyone even really think about fasting before Mass? I mean, and even as an hour before fasting, that means you're still, you could still be technically eating donuts as you're walking up the front steps because you're not going to go to communion until 60 minutes really later on. In it. Our Mass lasts an hour and 15, an hour and 20 minutes. You're going to communion at, you know, at 11 o'clock. I mean, so if you really wanted to push it, but most people don't even think about that at all. Who knows what they're doing, right? Okay, so that's the end of this letter. Read it, contemplate it, pray on it, and he tells you that's the whole idea of conversion, strengthening of the fasting, prayers, and alms, and penance. It is a glorious letter and very hard to put it in. Notice that he calls penance, fa prayer, fasting, and alms, he calls it on the last page, the restorative trinity. It restores us by these actions of prayers, fasting, and alms. Letter. Okay, now we are done until next fall. It is terrific seeing all. We'll finish with our last question. In the name of the Father and the 
Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. O God, Amen. you are before all ages, and you give us from the age to age. You are resplendent and glorified in unsearchable light. Through your word, you bring forth light and give us each day. O radiant day and source of all light, we glorify you, adore you, and offer you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayer. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of your Messiah. To him with you and the Holy Spirit be glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Mary conceived without sin. Pray, Pray for us who have recourse to you. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. But remember, you are the apostles now because no one else is reading this letter and no one else has this explanation. <laughs>